Hello, everybody. In this video, we'll be using OpenFOAM to perform a steady state uh, RANS analysis of a, of a 3D car. So this is called an um, action car, in this case. Uh, so it looks like this. Uh, so it's actually not a real car. It's just a, a toy car, like a matchbox uh, car. So we did this in Fluent as well. You can find a link to where the geometry is created over here. So the analysis we're going to perform is a RANS analysis. Uh, so a steady state turbulence modeling approach. And um, so our governing equations, uh, the DDT term is gone. So these are Navier-Stokes equations, or but they're the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations or the RANS equations. So our unknowns are um, the time average velocity or ensemble average velocity and the time average pressure or ensemble average pressure. This term over here, which comes from the um, time averaging um, approach is termed uh, the renal stress. Uh, and in this case, we're going to use this K omega SST uh, RANS eddy viscosity uh, modeling approach. Um, so for this case, a few different concepts are going to be introduced. So one is to do meshing, how to do 3D complex meshing in open foam. Um, so in addition to these slides you can find under the weekly tutorial, um, you can also find in the lecture notes um, uh, slides on, on meshing, meshing and open foam. Um, so we've gone through block mesh already, but uh, there's another mesh in open foam for complex geometry called snappy hex mesh. So snappy hex mesh is used as a Cartesian based meshing approach. So when we mesh this in, in Fluent, we, uh, we selected a Cartesian based meshing approach. It's a similar idea. So how does it work? Well, the way it works is you create a background grid mesh around where your geometry is. So this background grid mesh can be created anyway. So typically people would use block mesh to actually create the background uh, grid. It's just one big block. It's easy to do. So then you have your CAD and it'll be in some format and it's typically in this STL format. So it's a 3D printing format. It's, it's basically a file that is just a collection of triangles, or coordinates of triangles. So CAD softwares can all export in this STL format. So what Snappy Hex Mesh does is when we set it up, we run it, the first thing it does is it checks where the surface of the CAD SDL file overlaps the background mesh and it will refine the cells in those regions depending on what settings we give it. Um, that's how many, we can dictate how many levels of refinement from the background grid will occur. The next thing is it will delete the mesh on one side. So if we want to flow around our geometry, we'll tell it to keep the mesh around the geometry. If you want flow inside, we'll tell it to keep the mesh inside. So then we have this, what's known as a castellated surface, like the top of um, uh, a castle. And then the where it gets its name, snappy hex mesh, is it snaps the castellated surface. Here at these points get snapped uh, to the CAD geometry. So then you have the actual uh, mesh itself. Um, but one disadvantage of this, and we saw it in Fluent as well, is um, you get the worst cells right at the surface. So if you're trying to get um, accurate drag predictions in boundary layer uh, resolution, uh, it's not great. So an extra step can be to add layers here as well. So on the website for snappyxmesh on album.com or .org, uh, it'll show an extra step adding layers, but I ha haven't shown it here. Okay, so we're going to go through the, the steps um, here. Um, so when we're creating a new model in OpenFOAM, you never create a model from scratch. You always, um, you pick your solver, you find what solver might be suitable, and you find a tutorial example case for that solver, and you'll copy that example case, and you will edit the geometry, the materials, the boundary condition, and then run the case. So in this case, um, we're going to find a tutorial case um, for a RANS incompressible Navier Stokes solver. So and for steady state, so a simple foam uh, is a solver that does that. So we're going to find a simple foam um, tutorial. It's called simple foam because it has a simple um, algorithm. That's how it solves the UP coupling in steady state. So we're going to edit the geometry and the mesh, material properties, and then boundary loading conditions and any other time step settings uh, or schemes as well. Um, so there's some steps how we're going to do that through these slides, but I'm going to do that in the video itself. And also we're going to take advantage of the fact that statistically it'll, it'll be symmetric. So even though turbulence at any moment in time won't be symmetric, uh, the time average of this uh, symmetric case will uh, be a symmetric solution field. So the time average velocity and time average 
pressure will be symmetric. So like in fluent, we're just going to model half to the domain of the car. And, and okay, so let's jump over and, and start this up. So if you don't have it open, I'll just close it again. So, um, open up one, two. In fact, I'm gonna open up two of them just because I find that convenient. So if you remember to open up two, do this shift left click. So holding shift click, um, and I will open up the second one. So that means one of them we can use to have a block mesh stick or snappy hex mesh stick open while the other one can use it to run the commands. Okay, so I'm gonna move both to the run directory. Um, LS. So you can see we have our tutorial cases from the from the previous videos. Um, so let's find this um, this simple phone tutorial. So if I go LS phone tutorials, and once again I have to go escape, let go, draw E, a lot of complete that. Um, <coughs> I go uh, forward slash incompressible. Press enter, so you can see, and um, we have a bunch of incompressible fluid solvers. So we had been using Nyko foam, and there's simple foam. Simple, simple foam is the one we're going to look at. So if I press up and then type simple tab, you see we have a bunch of test cases. So motor motorbike is the one we're looking for. So that's external flow around uh, a man on, on a motorbike, basically. So if we jump back to the slide on meshing, uh, it explains how to run that case. You don't have to, but you can, uh, if you're interested in that. And you can run through it. So if you jump down here, this explains how to actually run the motorbike case. It takes maybe 15, 20 minutes to run it on a normal computer. And um, so you have a little cool little CAD man and um, you can run a simple phone analysis and you can get flow and drag on this little map on a motorbike. So that's available to run. Um, so that's motorbike there. So let's copy that. So I'll press up, delete all this auto completion. So I'll go CP-R, jump to the end of the line. So to jump to the end of the line, actually, the, you can use uh, Emacs uh, commands in the terminal. So Control E will jump to the end. Control A will jump to the start of the line. So Control E jumps to the end with the cursor. Control A jumps to the start. So the same works actually in Emacs if you're on a line. So single phone uh, motorbike tab. Get rid of the trailing space because the trailing space can actually copy the contents of the folder as opposed to the folder itself or directory itself. And we're going to put that in the current directory. So we could say dot, but I want to rename it as well. So I'm going to rename it to action car. Unless I have my action car a case, which is just motorbike, which is being renamed. You might at this stage, if you're more comfortable, you can go explorer.exe space dot. So you can open up your explorer folder so you can see, okay, here's my action car. This is what the case looks like. So it has some uh, scripts inside it all running all clean. clean. Um, so in the other slides, so if we go into action car now, if I wanted to run this motorbike case, basically, if I go dot forward slash all run, and dot means the current directory forward slash um, all run, that's how to run a script in the current directory. If I press enter now, that's a script which has a bunch of commands like mesh case and, and run uh, snappy hex mesh and then run the solver. So it'll do all the steps. Uh, you can open that in Emacs if you wanted to see the commands that are actually running, but we're, we're not going to go through that now. So we don't need that all run directory. We don't need that all clean directory. So I'm just going to remove what are those RM all star. And okay, first thing we need is our, our geometry. So um, you'll be able to download online. I've uploaded um, I've uploaded uh, the case, or not the case, the CAD geometry. So it's called actioncar.sdl. So I have it here on my uh, desktop. So I'm going to drag that across in here, and I'm just going to drag it into my Explorer folder. So that's probably the easiest way to copy it into your Linux. It's just an open explorer.exe and then drag it in. I also have Action Car front wheel and rear wheel. And um, I'm going to leave those out because it's just tedious. Uh, but we could include the wheels. I'm just going to leave the wheels out here as well, like we did in front. So that's all I'm going to copy over. And let me open back up these as well. So LS, I can see now my Action Car SDL. So this Action Car SDL, um, it's actually drawn in millimeters. So it's probably mean um, like 30, 40 millimeters long. It's actually 30, 40 meters long. Um, so I'm just going to scale this uh, CAD geometry to be the correct size, to be like an actual matchbox uh, car. 
So to do that, um, OpenFOAM has some built-in commands for scaling surfaces. You could do this in a CAD software, Inventor, SolidWorks, whatever, open it up, uh, export it as another size. Um, but I'll just do that in uh, OpenFOAM itself. So to do that, I'm gonna go surface convert capital C like that and dash, uh, I'll give the name this uh, surface. So I'm gonna uh, action car uh, STL and action car so that's going to be the, the name of the file we want to read. And then I'm going to make a, make a new file called Action Car uh, Small, or maybe uh, Meters. Uh, so Action Car Meters. Uh, .stl. Uh, so if uh, I ran that, but actually <laughs> that didn't do anything. <laughs> um, so I forgot to tell it to scale. So if we go dash scale 0 0.001. Yeah, so now that we wrote it out in the correct size. So now I have action car and action car and meters that is the end. This surface convert can let you convert between different formats and so STL to other surface based formats. Okay, so where do I put this? Well, um, in my system folder here, there's a bunch of files. Um, so we're familiar with the block mesh dict um, for creating our block mesh. We're familiar with um, a control dict for setting time steps. And then we didn't really look at FE schemes and FE solution, but there was different settings um, to do with the solution that we could control there. So there's another one uh, now called snappy hex mesh dict. So that's when we run snappy hex mesh command, it's going to read that dictionary. So inside that dictionary, we're going to specify the geometry and the different mesh settings we're going to use. So by default, the snappy hex mesh expects our CAD files to be in a certain place in our case. So if I ls the constant folder, and uh, there's a folder called geometry here. So if I ls constant geometry, there's a little readme there as well, a uh, file which I don't need to read, but I'm basically just gonna put uh, the mesh in there. So I just go action car meters, constant geometry, um, just like that. So if I ls constant geometry, you can see now I've moved my action car meters uh, into there. <coughs> just, um, for convenience, maybe I'll I'll copy this file or rename it or make a link, uh, just so I don't have the meter. So in fact, I'll just rename it Action Car um, get rid of the meters .stl. So in the PDF slides, uh, I don't have the name meters on it, so I'll just remove it here. So this is the, the scale one. Just be careful which one you're copying. So let me move back up two uh, two directories, back to the main directory. So we have original action car then, and then we have the smaller one. So I can delete the, the original one here. I don't need it anymore. Okay, first thing we need to do is make the background mesh and block mesh. So I'm gonna go Emacs system block mesh. This is the original block mesh that used for uh, the motorbike case. And so I'm gonna update the numbers here. So I have them uh, over here. I'll close this one, close this one. And um, so in this, Set of slides here. I actually have the, the block mesh the settings, some semi suitable ones. And uh, so I'm just going to copy this. And once again, what's if I was trying to simulate the car actually on a road and there is no box, so the domain size, there is no limiting domain size. Um, so essentially, you have to make this box large enough so it doesn't affect the results. So the boundaries need to be far enough away from the, to the car itself. So we're probably using something that's a bit too small here. So you probably need something that's five or 10 times the length of the car away to, to have uh, like less than a 1% effect on the car. But just for example purposes, we're going to do this here. Uh, so just go up to the top here. And for me, I just have to right click uh, to paste. So and um, you don't need to indent it here. I'm just indenting to make it easier to follow. Okay, it didn't actually work. So I'm just gonna delete all this other stuff. So if you want to quickly delete in uh, Emacs, you can just select and then cut it. So if I go Control Space, that says Mark Set. So Control, holding Control, press Space, and then that allows me to select, move down, and I get to the one of blocks. If I hold Control and press W, that will cut it. And so that's it gone. So you can see here, it's a bunch of different points and um, pointing the corners of the block. And then we have a certain grading on this and a certain number of cells. So I'm gonna save that, hold control, press X, S. 
I'm over here now. I'm going to go CD into my action car case and go to the way. Run uh, block mesh. Run block mesh. Now I've created my new block mesh. Yep, let's open this in power. You just see the, the block is in the right place. So I'll touch case on phone. Go to my explorer. Let's refresh it. Open the case in power view. So we have meshed uh, the, the true, uh, like the actual car yet. All we've done is made a block. So just a background block mesh, just one big block that looks like this. So this is going to be our background mesh for Snappy X mesh. So Snappy X mesh actually doesn't create an original mesh. It starts with a block mesh or something similar, and then it cuts uh, a geometry out of it and then refines it. So that's what Snappy X mesh does. So block mesh and Snappy X mesh are typically used together. So I have a bunch of errors down here basically saying that um, in the zero directory, all our boundary conditions don't really make sense at the moment. So let's not worry about that now. So um, this is our block, and um, I could turn on wireframe. I think my wireframe default color is set to white. Let me go edit settings, change that. Uh, edges, there's your black surface border. Uh, I'm not seeing it, it must be there somewhere, but I can change it for the specific color here. So if I just click here, we can set it black, that will show it. And um, yeah, okay, it's fine. So uh, if I actually go open in that corner here and go constant geometry and action car, this lets me just open the CAD. So part of you can naturally open uh, a lot of CAD formats. So if I press apply and it's color by this labeling, so I'll just turn it off. You can turn on the mesh if you wanted. So you can see an SDL is a triangular base mesh. So I can just leave that there. So you can see the block is in the right place, just checking the coordinates are correct. So you can see it's quite a small block around the car. It's a long way from 10 times uh, the distance in front or behind, but just for example purposes, it's fine. So you can see that that's where the car is going to be cut out. Okay, so we can just minimize power view out of the way there and minimize this. So if we go back to block mesh, I'm going to update the names of the patches. Um, as well, because they may be in the wrong order. So if I jump back over here and I jump to the next slide, slide seven, and you can see I've updated the boundary patches here. So I've split it into this is the first half, select it there, and jump back over here. I'm just gonna right click, paste it in. Let me go control space, select all of this, and then control W to get rid of all of it. And then go back here, select the remaining part. These are common, so it doesn't matter if you have select them or not. Um, block mesh will ignore them. Right click the paste. Save. So these are our new patches. So we're going to the top, an inlet, the ground, a center line is the symmetry plane, uh, side is the far side, and then we've an outlet. So save that. And over here, I'm just going to press open on block mesh to check block mesh is happy. I can run a quick check mesh if I wanted as well. I see the numbers 2000 cells. Every, everything's happy, there's no errors. Okay, so that's our block mesh now. Now we have to go into snappy hex mesh and the snappy hex mesh dip, and we're going to update things there. So in Emacs over here, I can just close it with holding control XC, but alternatively, I can just actually directly open another file. So if I hold control and press X and F, and down here, I can find a new file. So if I write snappy or SN tab, press enter, and now that's my snappy hex mesh dip open. So at the top of Snappy X Mesh, um, it does three sequential steps. So one, it creates a castellated mesh. So that's where it refines at the CAD surface um, the cells, and then it removes the inside of the car. After that, it does an extra step where it snaps that castellated surface to the CAD or the car geometry, and then finally you can add layers. So you can turn off layers or turn off snapping if you just wanted a castellated surface. And But we're going to leave all three of them on. So there's a bunch of different sections and an open form, they call them dictionaries. So anytime you have these open uh, curly braces, that's called a dictionary. So there's a geometry dictionary at the top. Uh, there's a bunch of comments. I will encourage you to read those, but I'm going to skip over them. So basically everywhere it mentions a motorbike, we're just going to replace that with action car. So you can see here, there's something called a tri-surface mesh, and it gives the name of a file, which is an OBJ. So it's not an SDL, it's another uh, format. So we're going to change that. To be, I'm going to call this 
action card. This is the name we're going to give to it. And we're going to, this name is going to be used later on to say like the mental refinement we need. And the file, if you remember, we called it action car.stl. So this uh, file, our snappy X measurement right reads this, it expects to find that in constant geometry. So that's what you put in constant geometry. Uh, so the readme the motor bike wasn't there, it's explained in the readme file, but that's stored internally in uh, the open foam installation because that's a standard tutorial, but typically you wouldn't do that. And so we're gonna store the action car.stl. So if you had a call action car meters.stl, you can just put that name in here. Separately, we're going to define another piece of geometry, which is a box, or you can have multiple boxes where you might want to refine the background mesh. So we may want to refine the background mesh just around the car or in the wake of the car. We may want to have like multiple refinement boxes. And um, so you can define those here. And um, so we are going to do that. If I jump down here, um, uh, you can see here is uh, the setup. So if you wanted to include the front wheels and back wheels, you can include them there. You can see I've commented it here, um, but we're going to include a, a refinement box. So I'm just going to take the min and max at uh, the bottom corners of that, and I'm going to right click to paste to get rid of those. So that refinement box on its own here is not doing anything, but later on we're going to associate a certain refinement level with that box. So this is kind of geometry we're defining. So in this geometry, you can either give it CAD files like this, or there's a bunch of uh, built-in simple CAD things like cylinders and boxes and, and spheres and things like that. Okay, so that's the geometry done. So we'll go down to the next dictionary. So this is the castellated mesh controls. So it basically goes castellated snapping layers. So that's kind of the structure of this file. Most of these settings you can just ignore. This is due to do with uh, how it refines and the max levels and things like that. So the only thing we care about here is features. So features, if you have sharp features in your mesh, like sharp edges on like at the edge of the uh, I don't know, like the hubcaps or something like that. Um, the default snappy hex mesh or Cartesian based meshing approach will tend to smooth those. So there is ways um, that you can like extract sharp edges from your CAD and then you could separately feed them in as their own individual eMesh file that the snappy hex mesh will use. I'm just going to ignore those. So I can either uh, delete that, but if you want to comment something in Emacs, you can just go control space to set a mark. Uh, to set a mark. Um, and then scroll down. And then if I hold control and press CC, uh, that will add comments. So it knows this is a C file, so it knows it's there in comments. Um, if you want to undo that, uh, it's a little bit more awkward. You can go control space, uh, make, make a mark. And then we're going to type a command, which is uh, to uh, indent uh, or to uncomment region. So you press escape and let go and press X. And that puts us down here. So MX here means escape, let go, press X. And then you write on comment tab, and then you're done. So there's a shortcut for commenting, but uh, there's no shortcut for on commenting. So I'm going to comment it again. Okay, so we're going Norda next refinement surfaces. So instead of a motorbike, we're going to have an action car. So that was the tag above. And the way it works is um, we define two levels. So there's a background grid. And uh, these two numbers represent uh, how many times that background grid is going to be uh, split. So if you uh, set it um, to refine uh, once, it would take the background squares in 2D and make split them in half to make four little squares or eight in 3D. So this is set to five to six, that's quite a lot. So I'll just set it to three and two. So there's a min and max, and uh, whether it uses min or max depends on how far away uh, the castellation is from the underlying CAD. So regions where it deviates a lot, it'll use a, uh, more refinement, where if it's a nice flat region that's aligned with the mesh, then it'll only use the coarser one. So we've got two and three, and we can leave this here. The only thing is in groups. In the motorbike case, they had many patches, like the visor is a patch, and where you can have a boundary condition or the helmet or uh, the wheels. In our case, we just have one giant patch, it's called uh, action car. Um, so we don't need to use this in groups thing where in groups are basically like collections of patches if you want to apply boundary conditions to collections of patches. So we're just going to comment that out. So this is everything, so two and three. And um, we're going to keep going. So then our refinement box we defined above. And um, we can tell that to refine inside that box or outside the box or both. 
and then we can specify how many times it's going to refine the background mesh. So we'll set it to two here. We're not going to use it as a fine mesh here just because I want it to run fast, but if you want to get more accurate results or results that have less mesh error, then you probably need to do a mesh sensitivity study. So we'll just set that to two, split the background mesh twice, and then the motorbike will be split out of that mesh and again, refined further. Okay, keep going now. The next thing is the snappy X mesh will refine inside and outside the car. If you remember, it's just refining along the surface of the CAD. So the back, the car is sitting in this background block mesh dip, and then it's refining wherever the surface crosses the background view. But then we have to tell it which piece of mesh do you want to keep, the mesh inside the car or outside the car. And that's what this location in mesh does. And um, so we just have to give it any coordinate that's in, uh, in the domain, and then it'll keep that part. So um, if I jump down, um, here, here's our location of mesh. So here is a coordinate, and we can check this in. Um, when we open up our view, if you wanted, we can check that it actually is in the correct place. So if I just go back here, I right click. If we want to just check in power view, so it's minus a millimeter, four millimeters, plus one millimeter. So if we want to check that, we can make a little sphere. So if we go sources and search. S P A G R E. Just press enter. You can click on this or press enter. It's going to make a sphere. So we're going to center that minus one millimeter and plus zero four millimeter. I'm pressing tab here to skip, and then I can't remember what the last one was. It was plus one millimeter, and let's just make a zero point zero. Not one millimeter, maybe half a millimeter. It'll uh, sphere. So press apply on that. Can we see this little sphere? Yeah, there it is. So if you just, just see it over, over there, if I uh, look from this angle, you can see Z is the uh, vertical direction. So it's just four millimeters off the ground. So I could have put it right in the center of the box, uh, but that just, that just happened to be a coordinate uh, I picked that's inside the box. The only thing you have to be careful of is don't put it right on the boundary of the surface, uh, on the boundary of the domain, put it in the domain uh, somewhere. So I can just turn off that through. And so I'll click here, go to my group of terminals. So that's fine. Keep going. So snapping controls. This is how it governs how it snaps to the CAD surface. There's not much to do here. We're going to leave the default settings. It's basically if you have problems with snapping, you can, if you have problems when, when snapping occurs, it tends to make the cells much worse in an attempt to capture geometry better. So it's typically a trade off. If you want a better cells, you can loosen how well it snaps. So it doesn't really follow the CAD that well, but at least you've got cells. So there's going to be a trade off between those things, but the defaults are fine. And then the add layer controls. Um, we're just going to delete the names here of all the files and just change it to action car. So it's trying, going to try to stick one layer of cells, nice cells around the body of the action car. So that's fine. We can tell it to try add more. Um, typically adding layers can be difficult. Um, so it can aim for more, but it may not give all of them. So that's pretty much it. There are other settings and all these other mesh quality settings are fine. We can just leave them the way they are. So if we just save that, holding control, press XS. And then over here now, um, in our case, if you run snappy hex mesh, so we run block mesh, the background, the background mesh is there. And um, so now we're gonna run a, um, we're gonna run snappy hex mesh. So snappy hex mesh. So when snappy hex mesh runs by default, it will create the new meshes. So it'll create the castellated mesh, then the snap to mesh, and then the layered mesh in different time steps. So you could look at them in part of you, like play in time and see the mesh progressing. And, but that's more just for debugging, checking everything works. So here we're just going to use a flag called overwrite. So that's just going to overwrite our default mesh. And, with the, the final snappy X mesh. So if we just press enter, so snappy X mesh space dash overwrite, and it's gonna print a load of stuff to the screen. We're not gonna read any of it, but if you wanted to track it, you can see it's basically going through cycles of adding uh, refining cells and uh, smoothing the mesh and, and uh, lots of different things like that involve meshing. So as you can imagine, if you were doing it like a really analysis of like in an automotive company of like an external aerodynamics, you could have cells that are meshes that easily have hundreds of millions of cells. And uh, so this running snappy hex mesh can, can take hours um, and then running the simulation could actually potentially even take less time than it requires to run the mesh. So typically uh, 
the mesher and the solver will be running parallel on multiple CPU cores. So at the moment, Snappy X message doesn't matter how fancy a computer I have, by running it the way around it there, it's just running on one core. But later on, we can, we're going to have a tutorial on uh, running in parallel using high performance computing and uh, how to run open form solvers and utilities in parallel. Okay, so with my settings, it took 42 seconds on my computer. So if I just run check mesh, see what the mesh looks like. So let's see how many cells we have. So we have 120,000 cells. It's still pretty coarse, but you can see how the cells uh, rack up. Um, we do have an error here. So we have a max skewness of 4.0004. So um, I think the limit is four for skewness. I'm not sure if we can see that somewhere. So it's not that bad. Um, we basically have one cell somewhere where it's a bit skewed. So it, it's fine. It's basically check mesh is not happy, but the open foam, simple foam solver will, will deal with it. Uh, but we may just have to make some setting adjustments just to get it working. If I just slightly find your mesh, probably I'd end up a better quality mesh. So back here, click on our case dot foam, um, and I'll click refresh. So that uh, reread the, the mesh. Uh, so we have a bunch of new boundary conditions now. So if I click back, it will reread the actual mesh itself. So initially read the names of the batches, and then if I skip time after clicking refresh, it actually reads the mesh. So you can kind of see here now, if I turn off my CAD geometry, uh, and then maybe set it to surface with edges, and I don't want to color it black. So I think I said it would be black here if I set it to white. So now we can kind of see the mesh. So you can see the way the car is actually cut out. And if I zoom in, you can't see it very well, but there is actually one layer around quite a bit of the surface. Not all the surface, but quite a bit of it. Uh, so I was able to put one layer. So maybe it'd be better if we put like a bunch of layers. So we have a, like a nice boundary layer. Uh, a couple of things to note, you can see some weird looking cells here. So um, mostly these are hexahedral cells, six faced uh, 3D cells. But you can get at the interface where it's snapped, you can get general polyhedral cells that have more than six faces. So part of you by default doesn't know how to visualize those. So it split them into tetrahedral and hexahedra. So these lines here are not part of the open mesh, it's just a, a visual artifact in power view. So if you click this little cog here while you're on case at home, if you wanted, um, you can, uh, this option decompose polyhedra appears. So if you unclick that, which is ticked by default, press apply, uh, then it shows you the actual open form mesh. So uh, it shows where big cells put the small cells. So it doesn't add these extra triangle uh, lines. So if you wanted, you can cut through this. So like you can make a clip plane. So I get this one here. I'll change it to the uh, X direction. No, Y direction, Y direction. Maybe drag that plane somewhere there. Press apply. Uh, keeping the wrong side. So I'm going to untick this invert. That's fine. Untick the show plane. And then I'll click crinkle, crinkle clip. So crinkle clip will keep all the cells it cuts through. So if I turn on the mesh here, so this is actually a slice, slice through the mesh, and you can kind of see some of the kind of funky cells that are we're cutting through in the shape. So that's fine. We can uh, turn off that clip and see the original mesh. Okay, so our mesh looks okay. It's not super quality, but it looks fine. Um, the refinement box didn't really do anything um, unless we set it too big, uh, but that's that's fine. Go back to our terminal. Okay, so what do we have to do next? So we've changed the geometry and mesh from the science, so dear properties and boundary conditions are the next. So over here in my Emacs, I'm gonna close that, control X C L S. Uh, so material properties, if I go Emacs constant, I have transport properties. And um, so for simple foam. It's like icofoam, but there's an extra option, which is the transport model. So it doesn't have to be Newtonian, uh, but we're using Newtonian here. And this is the uh, kinematic viscosity. Close that. And there's something called turbulence um, as well, or momentum transport in this case. Uh, some of the other versions of OpenFoam call it turbulence properties. Momentum transport here. Um, so simple foam allows for turbulence modeling. Um, so in this case, uh, the simulation type is set to RAS RES. So that's in open form, that's what they call RANS. So it's Randall average uh, stress models. So Randall's average average stokes. 
in this case, the Reynolds, uh, the turbulence model being used is a Rand's model, an eddy viscosity model, and it's K omega SSD. So this is actually the default model, uh, turbulence Rand's model used in Fluent as well. So it's a generally, it's a combination of K omega and K epsilon. Um, so it's a generally relatively very useful and decent turbulence uh, model. So it's K epsilon, or like in the free stream and K omega closer to the walls. Um, so if I close out of that, we're not going to have to change anything there. Um, everything's fine in those properties. So boundary conditions is the last thing. So if I ls in zero, and in fact, it might, uh, if we look here, we have u.org cell level and include folder k and surfaces new t omega p point level thickness thickness fraction so a bunch of these files were actually made by snappy hex mesh and it's to do just tracking their refinement levels so cell level and um, point level thickness thickness function we can delete all those but i'll, I'll leave them they're not uh, hurting anything so the actual files we'll need in this case we're solving for velocity so u and um, uh, pressure so time average velocity and time average pressure our ensemble averaged. And then we have K omega. So that's K and omega. So when you boundary conditions for K and omega, they're scalars. And then the last thing is just new T. So this is the uh, turbulent viscosity. So it doesn't solve for turbulent viscosity, uh, but um, the way it's calculated, it may need wall functions. So we can just specify those in those. So we're going to do that for all the files. So why is U called U.org and not U? Well, we're going to um, talk about that just before we run the solver, but we're going to leave it just called U.org for now. In a minute, we're going to rename it, but for now, we're going to leave it at u.org. So let's go 0 forward slash u.org. So there's a couple of things we're going to notice in this file that we didn't notice in the Cavi case. So to begin with, there's this hash include statement. So hash include is something in C or C++ code, which is basically just take this file and copy and paste it into this point here. So if you hash include something in in C or C++, it basically just says, find this, whatever's in this, and copy and paste it, replace it exactly here. So uh, in more recent versions of OpenFOAM, they allow that option in the different files. So if you wanted to have something defined in multiple files, rather than copy and paste it in lots of files, you can just put it in one file and then include that file everywhere. So let's just see what they're defining. So in a folder called include in zero, there is a file called initial conditions. So if I go xf, a folder called include, and inside it, initial conditions. So it's a file that actually is just defining variables. So maybe just in case you got lost there, I'll go back to my GUI, graphic user interface, go zero. There's a folder here called include, and it has a file called initial conditions. That's what it's called. So it's just for convenience. You don't have to do this, but they've just defined these variables. So they define the flow velocity, that's 20 meters per second in the X. So we're going to change that actually, um, because our inlet is actually in the Y. And it was X for the motorbike. And we have a much smaller car. It's not a full-size motorbike. It's just a toy car. So we're going to say it's two meters per second in the Y direction. And then they're finding pressure. And then turbul turbulence kinetic energy is OK. And then turbulent omega or dissipation. Um, <coughs> so those uh, values have been calculated, basically, it's like a percentage dissipation. I'm just going to leave those uh, to be the way they are. So xf, go back and open u.org. So those variables are defined like flow of velocity, so that when they use dollar flow of velocity here, dollar here, like for environment variables, means use the value of that. So we could, and um, for that line, I could just directly put in the flow of velocity of zero to zero, but they're just showing an example. You can just use a variable to do that. So that's fine. We'll leave that. I have a couple of other includes here. So there's another one, include fixed inlet. So you can see here, fixed inlet. So we can go open that, xf, include fixed inlet. And um, so they just have inlet, fixed value internal field. So they're just defining the inlet there. That's fine. So I'll go xf out of that. They're just showing you can define it in this other file. And um, so then if the outlet, and they're saying the outlet uh, value. Um, it's they have this inlet outlet boundary condition. So it's, it's kind of like a zero gradient, but it's just if you get any, it's a special boundary condition. If you get backflow, it basically converts into a wall. So there's a similar condition in, in Fluent. And then the lower wall. Um, so if you remember our lower wall, we actually call that ground. So let's just rename that to ground. 
and the ground is a fixed value moving at this internal field and this internal field is the flow velocity. So the way they've set it up here, they basically imagine that their reference frame, their coordinate system is moving with the motorbike. So the motorbike is traveling at zero meters per second and, and the road is traveling past them at 20 meters per second. So we'll follow the same idea. So the, the ground is basically moving relative to the car. So we're gonna say the ground is moving relative to the car. And then instead of the motorbike group, we have our action car. And that's a no slip wall. That's like a station no slip wall. Finally, at the bottom here, they've include another include front, back, upper planes. Sorry, we'll open that. Include front, back, upper planes. So they've upper wall, but we actually call that top. And then they front and back, but we actually call that um, side. So they didn't take advantage of symmetry. So I think actually we call it side one. So we're going to call that side one. So I'll save that. Get back into my new.org. So that's my U condition, um, U boundary condition update. Let's go to P next, so control XF, P. So once again, they're letting the same variables be def defined. So they're not using all of them. You can see that's where pressure came from. And um, we've inlet, outlet will be the same. Lower wall will change to ground. And um, motorbike will be action car. And basically it has its typical influence and open form. Um, you don't set the pressure on a wall, you only set the pressure on an outlet. And on a wall, you set a gradient to zero. So if you plot the pressure away from the wall perpendicular, you're assuming that uh, it, it doesn't change in the close vicinity of the wall. Um, so um, that's great. The nice thing here is uh, for our top and side wall, they're going to be no slip. So we can just uh, have the exact same file. Here's the convenience. We don't have to say no slip again. We can just say no slip for you, no slip for for being no slip, and I don't know what to do for a no slip wall. Okay, so control XF, and the next thing is the K, okay, turbulent kinetic energy. All we're doing here is just renaming lower wall to ground and motorbike to action car. Save, X, control X, S, and then control X, F, and omega. Do the same thing again. So lower wall would be ground and motorbike group. Save it. And then the last one is new T, the turbulent viscosity. So we have to change the lower wall to be um, ground. The upper wall here will be um, renamed to top. That's what we call the upper wall. And motor group, bike group is called action car. Um, they had front and back, but our front and back we call side uh, one. And this thing which I didn't mention is include etc. That's like a, a special command where it's basically open form is looking for any symmetry planes and it automatically just defines symmetry conditions. So you don't have to say for our center line, it's called symmetry. So that's that's kind of convenient to have that. So save that. That's our boundary conditions uh, ready to go. So now I'm going to go into the zero directory and rather than rename zero.org, or u.org or, or, or ridge, um, which stands for original, to u. I'm just going to copy it. So I'm going to copy u.ridge to u. You can see there's some file that squiggles after it. So that's by default, Emacs will make a backup of files. So we can delete those and you can turn that off for Emacs if you Google how to do that if you want, but we can leave it for now. For now. So if you and u.ridge that are the same. So the reason I'm doing that is before I run my simple form solver, uh, you can initialize the fields to give them a better guess. And one way to do that is using something called potential form. So inside Fluent, there's hybrid initialization, which is doing a similar thing where um, if you simplify the Navier Stokes equations, um, we'll assume uh, 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 potential flow theory. So you can check up that on your simplified uh, models and the excerpt from Fertig and Parrish. So for potential flow theory, which is really simplified like slow flow, um, that you don't have to solve your, your full average stock equation. You just have to solve from one scalar called the potential or the velocity potential. And when you calculate that, you can calculate the velocity from that. So it's quick to do that. So if we run potential foam, so potential foam is actually a, a simple solver. That will uh, 
take our U field and it'll go in and it'll give an initial value for all the cells in the U field. So this is why we make a backup of the U file, because if we don't, then when we open the U file, it'll be 100,000 lines long with all the initial values. So this allows us to overwrite it each time. So um, when I did that, um, gave me an error. So I must have uh, missed out some naming somewhere. So let's read the error and understand it. So it says, it cannot find patch field action car and it's looking for it in zero U boundary field. So it must have forgot to put action car in zero U. So I'm gonna go into the region, uh, U down the region, copy it over there. Yeah, so ground, and you can see here, I wrote action instead of action car. So let me save that, close it again. We're gonna copy zero dot U down the ridge uh, to zero U. And write the potential form again. Um, I would say you can't find the action car in P. So I obviously forgot to do that one as well. So uh, action car, hopefully I didn't do that in all of them. Let me check, did we do that in K as well? No, okay, it was just for UMP, I did it wrong. So let's try potential form again. Okay, so now potential form is happy. So it read down through, uh, it um, solves for phi, this velocity potential. Um, and it does 10 iterations. And then from that, it calculates a certain velocity field as an initial guess for the velocity field. And that, when simple form starts, that will help it converge faster. So if I was to open in Emacs, the actual U file now, uh, I think my uh, Windows is a little slow to open this, but okay, it's fine. So what happens here is there's this big old gar garbage. So this is, um, this is binary basically. So just for, uh, smaller storage, the actual numbers are actually stored in binary. You can change that in the control dict, but it's fine. So these are actually the 124,000 cells in our mesh. They're the initial value of, of uh, velocity and all of those. So it only does it for velocity, it doesn't do it for pressure. That's an initial uh, velocity field. Okay, before running um, simple form, there's a couple of other settings. So we're gonna go to Emacs system control dict. So at the bottom of the control dict, <coughs> after all the time settings and how many time steps to do, um, there's something called functions or function objects. So uh, this is kind of similar to in Fluent, you have your reports. So if you wanted to store uh, forces or the force coefficients, um, you would make like a report or a monitor in Fluent, but in OpenFOAM they call those function objects. And there's function objects that do all sorts of uh, interesting things in OpenFOAM. So there's actually three included here. So once again, you can see an include. Uh, so, um, and so this include here, um, once again, it's just copying and pasting, looking for a file in that current folder. So there's one called streamlines, cutting planes, forces. So you could actually just have the text copy and paste it here, but just for tidiness and convenience, uh, they've actually made uh, extra files for that. So if we go action car system, you see that there's one called streamlines, uh, force coefs and cutting plane should be there. So uh, streamlines and cutting plane, there's actually post process in the function objects. So rather than use power view to make a cutting plane, if you have a very big case, as in hundreds of millions of cells, it can be very slow to open that in Paraview. And so you can actually get open form to just save screenshots or cutting planes or streamlines directly as it runs. And then you can just open those streamlines up rather than the full case in Paraview, which is much quicker. But we're just gonna turn those off. So the only one we want, so I'm commenting those, the only one we want is force coefficients. So if I go X, control X, F, force coefs, this is how a force coefficient function object is defined. So if you Google open form function object, you'll see loads of different examples. And uh, there's nothing really to change except for patches. And we're gonna go action car in quotes. And our lift direction is Z, but our drag direction is Y. Coefficient of the or the center of rotation, I'm not sure where it is, or for the, the length, the reference length and area for the coefficient calculations, uh, they're not quite right. So if you wanted, you could look those up. So the, the scaling of our force coefficients won't be right, uh, uh, but there'll be approximately the right trends. So uh, close out of that. So before running it, I'm just going to look at a few extra things. So if I look at FE schemes, so these are the schemes, you don't normally change these. 
Um, but in this case, I know I have a kind of bad mesh. I think it won't actually converge very well in uh, the current settings. I'm going to use slightly more conservative settings. So one of the key ones in fluid mechanics is how this convection term is discretized. Uh, so this, you may have heard of upwind. So this the versions of phi u. Uh, instead, it's linear upwind grad u, which is a second order convection. I'm just going to change it to upwind first order. So there's not many things you're going to change in this, but uh, typically bounded Gauss upwind or Gauss upwind won't be as accurate for a given mesh. It has a lower order of accuracy, uh, but they're quite stable. So I'm just going to use that. So what sometimes people will do is they'll use all these first order schemes uh, to run simple foam first time. That would get a converged first order solution. And then they restart from the latest, that latest answer with higher order schemes, and then they converge again. Whereas if you started directly with second order schemes, it might just not converge. It just blows up. Uh, but just for now, I'm just going to use a, a, a first order scheme. Um, and then the last thing is FE solutions. This is to do with things like iterations. So these linear solver settings are, I'm going to leave. So you can see this potential flow section where I did 10 correctors. So that's why uh, potential foam with 10 correctors happens to find here. Uh, simple foam will have settings here. And then there's some relaxation factors that are set by default. So I'm just going to add, once again, more conservative convergence settings. I'm going to add a little, sec a little dictionary about fields. And P and 0 0.3. So if you look at the default settings, for example, in fluent, that would have something like pressure relaxation factor 0 0.3. We're not going to go into what they are, but basically the lower these numbers are, the easier it is to converge, but the slower it is to converge. Um, but if you set them too high, they may not converge at all. So I'm just trying to help it converge. And then the last thing is, by default, we haven't defined any residual monitor. So in the latest versions of Fluent, uh, it, they default to 1 to minus 3. So once the residuals get to 1 to minus 3, it'll stop. But in an open form, just by default, they just run to the max correctors. And um, so that's like all versions of Fluent did that. So you actually have to tell it or add a residual control, it's called. So if I, in this simple, Dictionary, if I add another dictionary called residual control. And then basically for any fields that are uh, solved, I can add a control for those. So U is solved. So I can add um, one E minus four for U. And then we have P. And maybe one each minus four is fine. Actually, I'll just go one each minus three for P because P represents continuity and it's often slower to converge. K and omega, we can add K and omega, but in this case, I'm just going to leave them. Whatever they converge is fine as long as U and P converge to these tolerances. The last thing is if I just jump back to control dict, simple form is a steady state solver. So there's no such thing as time, it's just iterations. So the end time here just represents 500 iterations. And the delta t doesn't represent one second, it's just one iteration. So it's going to do 500 iterations and then it's going to write the results every 100. Because I've added residual control, that means when it converges, it will write the results on the convergence iteration, uh, as we'll see, hopefully, it'll be something like uh, between one and 200 iterations. Um, and then it'll stop. So if I didn't have that residual control, it would just go to 500, even if the residual is very fine already or tight already. In this case, the residual control should stop it uh, when it gets to the required residuals. So save that. Okay, so we're ready to run a uh, simple phone. I'll do it over here. Man, this is going to be simple phone. But it may take a minute or so to run, and it's going to print a lot of things to the screen. Um, but rather than printing things to the screen, um, any command in the terminal, if you just want to put whatever it's writing to the screen, if you want to put it in a file, you can do that using a greater than symbol. So if you imagine greater than, it's like an arrow. So it's like catching what's coming into the big side and then pointing it in uh, to, uh, the, to the point. And you can just put it into a file. So you can just give a file's name and it'll make a file. And as things are being uh, coming from that command, it'll put it into that file. So typically, the convention in open form is often to call the files from utilities or solvers. They call them logs, and they often call them log dot simple form or log dot dot mesh or whatever. And so, what gets written to the screen? The screen is called standard output. So this is redirecting the standard output into a file. And if there's any errors, um, 
they also by default get rid of the screen, but they're actually called standard error. So when we go greater than here, it redirects the standard output, like the standard output and solver to a log, but the, any errors actually still get put to the screen. So we have to stick an ampersand, which is like an and in front of the greater than, if we want the standard error and the standard output. So basically just by default, if you want everything to go into the log, just put greater than ampersand. So that's gonna put everything into the log. If I press enter on this though, um, which I'll do now, you see here, I'm just pressing enter and over and over again. I just can't do anything. So while that command is running, I just can't use this term. So um, I'm going to uh, control C that. So just hold control and press C to kill that command. If I press LS, I can't. And there's nothing really here. You can see a post processing directory was created. That's for the force coefficients. So I'm just going to delete that. I'm going to run that command again. I'm going to delete the log file. So I'm going to run that command again, but I'm going to put it in the background. So space ampersand at the end. So if you put ampersand at the end of the command, it puts the command in the background. So it will run in the background and you can still use it. So that's the job running in the background. So I can now watch what's been written to this log. So if I go tail log phone, that shows me the last 10 lines of that uh, file. So if I do it again, I can see the next 10. So it's gone iteration 30, 45. If I want to keep seeing what's been written, if I go tail dash F, that will keep show what's been written. So I can see what's been written to the tail of this file. So you can see it's going 90 iterations, 95. You can see the residuals are dropping. Hopefully the force coefficients are converging. So I'm going to go control C. That control C didn't kill the solver, it just killed the tail command. So if I press it again, I can see it's still writing. So control Z, LS. If I type jobs, that shows me jobs running in the background. And if I wanted to kill one of these jobs, I can go um, FG1, because this is job one. That'll bring that to the front. And if I control C, that will kill it. I don't want to kill it here though. So I'm going to go control Z, which puts it back in the background, but it, it pauses it, it actually stops it. So you have to type BG background to put it back in the background. So maybe it's a little bit confusing, but I maybe just replay that part of the video to try to understand what's happening. So jobs, we can see it's in the background. And let's go tail dash F, log simple form, see how it's doing. So if I just control C it there, let's see how the residuals and the initial residuals. Uh, I think I asked lost to get one E to minus four, so there are five, five E to minus four, and our pressure is, is less than one E to minus three. Um, so it's probably a, a bit ways out. So it may actually go to the 500 iterations. So maybe I could have just set it to one easy to minus three volume just to get it to converge. But I'll see, I'll give it a second when I converge. Okay, they're getting smaller. They, they may get there before yeah, 500. So as this is writing, and um, because we asked for force coefficients, a folder called post-processing actually gets created. And that's where these function objects are writing. And the files. So it made something called force coefs one, and inside that there's a directory called zero, and inside that there's a force coefs file. So if I open that up at Emacs, force coefs, uh, you can see it's actually uh, writing time and then it's writing the drag and lift uh, coefficients. And I can't remember one of these are the, one of them is the coefficient and one of them is the, um, uh, the actual Newtons. And I think this is a moment as well. So it's writing them for each iteration. So rather than monitoring the residuals for conversions, you can monitor these and then these, these uh, become steady, then you can say it's conversion. Of course, you could use a, a tail command. Okay, so you can see it's done now. If I just tail log dot simple form to see the very end. In fact, I'm just going to open it, meet Emacs the log. I'm going to jump to the end. So if you press escape, let go, and then go greater than so. It's shift full stop on my computer keyboard. You can see it actually went to the 500 iterations and because all the residuals they can get below one e to the minus four. So that, that's that's fine. Uh, it's, it's converged well enough in this case. Okay, so you can see it actually wrote the results at 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. If I let it go more iterations, it probably would have converged say in seven or six and 50. Yep, so let's open up the, the results in, in uh, PowerView. So go back to PowerView, refresh, and then just change time set. Let's get back to the start. Now we should have uh, five time steps in this case. Um, so for each one of those, we should have a uh, U, 
So we can see from time zero, we have our velocity u. We'll turn off the mesh here. So the velocity field, if I skip forward a time step, it's changing a bit, changing a bit, changing a bit. And then it's starting to converge now. So the last time step is pretty much converged. You can rescale over here just to check how it looks. Um, so you can see that the velocity, the wake around the car, you can look at uh, different components, um, look at our K. We can, uh, that's the uh, turbulent kinetic energy. So that's uh, basically where the, mm, the small turbulent eddies, which we're not directly modeling their uh, rotation, but that's where most of their energy is stored in the wake. And then where it's been dissipated, uh, is this omega? Okay, maybe it's scale uh, where the wheel is, is probably dominating it. See there. And then P. So just to see some of the results uh, more easily, let's only turn on the ground. So instead of internal, if we write patch ground and patch action car. So turn on those patches. So it's a bit easier for seeing the pressure. So let's reflect this geometry now, like we did influence. So if we go filters, search, uh, reflect, press enter. And then we want to reflect it about the max and the x coordinate. So x max and copy input. So there's our full car. So you get high pressure at the front where the air is slamming into the front of the car, low pressure at the back. So you get like uh, different like kind of suction points, different points around the car. And um, so that looks fine. You start pressure distribution on the ground as well. And um, next thing we might want to do is to make uh, streamlines. So in this case, if we try to make streamlines in this case, that foam, because we don't have the full mesh loaded, we only have the patches, we, we cannot make streamlines on the patch. So for convenience, we're just going to open the actual um, case dot foam file the second time. So we're opening the model basically twice in Barbie. So the second time with the internal mesh. So there it is. I'm going to reflect that one too. So reflect x max. So this is the reflection second one. And then we're going to make streamlines out. So click streamlines here, stream tracers. So previously, you can see there's a point from the top corner to the top corner. If we press apply, you'll see it makes a bunch of streamlines. So let me just turn that line off. Line. So, okay, there's a lot of them there. Maybe I could just scale that a bit less. So uh, the resolution of the line is here, 1000. So maybe set up 20, there's a buy. Okay, you can see there's a bunch of streamlines there. So we could do something like that, maybe set the line um, just in front of the car. But instead of a C typing line, we do point cloud. So we have this, this thing there. So maybe I'll just turn back on my reflect and I'll just select stream tracer. And then if you notice here, uh, you can press P to make a new center. So if I hover over the front here with my mouse and press P, it'll just drag this point cloud to the front. So you can drag that around your mouse if you want to get better or give the coordinates. And I'll press apply now. And I'll turn off this reflect. So now you can see it's generating seeds within that sphere. So I can change the radius of that sphere if I want, make it a bigger, 0 0.03. And um, press apply. Yeah, not bad. Maybe even 0 0.04. Um, press apply. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to move that. Um, I can turn off that sphere. Yeah, that's loads. So press apply. And then if you wanted, you can go uh, filter, search, and choose your ribbon. So let's say choose, just to make them look nice. Press apply. And we have very thick tubes there with very coarse resolution. So maybe increase the resolution to 40 little sides. And the radius can maybe be a bit smaller. So maybe 0, 0.5. Yeah, so there's a nice streamlines. You can play with the opacity and stuff like that. So the final thing here is if I select this reflect two, maybe I'll do it or something like that. So if I make a slice. Maybe slice in the Z direction. And I drag that down somewhere around there. Actually, maybe I'll, I'll do the uh, Y direction. That would be nice. So maybe just at the center of the car. 
and press apply. Turn off that plane, wherever it is, show plane. We turn off the tubes for a second, it's kind of busy. So on that plane, maybe we'll show uh, velocity. And we scale. You can see, okay, it has to slow down wherever it's touched the car, but you can see you get acceleration regions around the car uh, itself. So you can play with opacity and you can turn on your streamlines and all of those uh, things as well. So you can maybe show, uh, show that. The last thing I'm going to show in this tutorial um, is how to plot uh, the logs. So in this case, we store this log file. So OpenFoam has a utility called foam log. And then if you just give it the log file, so foam log space log dot simple foam, press enter, and it'll extract anything useful out of the log file. So it extracts loads of information. So if I go ls, I made a directory called logs by ls logs or logs. It has loads of different files. So if I go emacs logs, say um, ux underscore zero. This is basically for each iteration giving the UX residual. And there's a similar file for UI, UZ, and P, and K, and Omega. So you could plot those files to check the residuals. So how do we plot them? Well, there's a utility called GNU plot, which is built in the Ubuntu terminal. And at least it should be. If it's not, you can go sudo apt install GNU plot. Uh, you shouldn't have to do that, but just in case it, it says GNU plot command not found, that will download it from the internet and install it for you. So I just press Control C to be, I go to the next line without executing it. So I, I type GNU plot. So GNU plot by default will try open a window when you plot it. But because I'm using Ubuntu in WSL and in Windows, that graphic component is awkwardly set up. So I'm not, it can be done, but I'm not going to bother doing it. So instead, I'm going to tell GNU plot just to create a image file, so a PNG file. So to do that, I'll say set term and then G. Yeah, so that's just going to tell it when we make a plot, to just make a, a file called a PNG. And then I'm going to say set output. So we're actually in a GNU plot terminal here. So I set output and quotes. I'll call it residuals.png and quotes. So now I've told it the file. Now I'm going to write a plot command. So GNU plot is pretty simple. You just go plot. Open quotes and then the name of the file you want to plot from. So we're going to go zero p. If I go tab or not zero, sorry, logs p zero. So that's the pressure. And then close quotes and then width lines. You no know, width points or width line points. So if I press enter um, now, and if I go back to my Windows Explorer, go back to the action car, you should see I have your residuals PNG file here. So if I double click on that. And this is showing the pressure residuals converging. So there's a couple of things I want to change here. One, I want to have a log axis, and also I want to show the velocities as well. So I'm just going to delete this file. And um, so I'm going to press up. I'm going to go comma, quotes, logs, UX, score, width, lines, comma, open quotes, logs, U, Y, uh, underscore, tab. So actually, there's loads of shortcuts in um, new plot. So instead of with lines, you can just write W, L. Um, so it's just for a shortcut. It has the same thing. And logs, U, Z, underscore, and then with lines again. I do that. I refresh. Recreate it, and if it doesn't, I may need to just run the set output residuals file again. And actually, before running this, I'll go set log scale y. So tell it to use a log scale on the y, and now I'll run the plot command again and rescale. Okay, so I have my residuals. Double click on that, and uh, there you go. So there are the residual files that you might use to see in. Um, in Fluent, for example. So you can see they're dropping down here. So I, I can make this fancier. I can turn on a background grid and set this to uh, a scientific uh, representation for numbers. But you can see I was aiming for only to minus four for velocities. So that was the green, blue, and orange. So 
green and blue got there, but orange was about to get there, get there. So probably definitely within 600 iterations it would convert and the pressure was within the leading minus three. Um, okay, so um, that is the end of this uh, tutorial.